Awesome. <laughs> so should we wait for people to sign in? Um, yeah, we say hi. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to to our webinar. We are just waiting for a few people to sign in, and we'll get started in a few minutes. You can say hi to the IG live. This is an IG live. As well. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I I feel like I'm yeah okay. How is everyone doing? Excited. Same. <laughs> What's that on your back wall? This? Me? Gordon. Gordon. <laughs> Gordon, are you on mute? Results are excuses, not both. Yeah, I think Gordon's on. I, I like that. I'm a results kind of girl, Steve. <laughs> Gordon, I'll just wait until you're, um, okay, yeah, I figure, wait until he figures out his mic and then we'll get started. So for everyone who has just joined, uh, we're about to get started in a few minutes. Welcome. And it'd be great if while we were waiting, if you guys um, who, are, who are already on could just drop us a hello in the chat. Just say hi so that we know you're here, that you can hear us. Um, we see that we have a few, per quite a few persons on at the beginning. So just, just give us a quick wave so that we know that you're out there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Gordon has Sorry, one. guys. I had a tech malfunction. You're hearing me, right? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, great. Um, no, you're asking what was on my wall. Yeah. It's um, You can have results or excuses, not both. That's on that category. Back. Yeah. Absolutely. Excuses are for losers. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Um, I'm ready to get it kicked off. How about you guys? Sorry, how many people do we have on? Uh, we're right. live, right? Aren't we live? Yes, yes we, are. we are. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We're looking for this conversation. So welcome everyone. This welcome to another AISK web series. The topic for today's webinar is technology in education shaping future ready children so my name is chenille lafayette and i'll be your moderator for today but a few housekeeping items before we begin this webinar will be recorded and so you'll be able to find it on the aisk youtube after this is finished it will be uploaded so don't worry and secondly you do have the option of submitting questions to the panel throughout the entire webinar we'll probably address them during the webinar or in the question and answer phase of the webinar so let's just get started um, by introducing our panelists. So Nicola, starting with you first. Hi, everybody. I'm Nicola Melhedo, and I am the head of projects at the American International School of Kingston. I'm very excited to tell you guys all about the technology that goes on there. Okay. Stacy, how about you? Hi, guys. I'm excited to be back. Thank you so much. Um, I'm a parent at AISK, and I'm one of the lucky beneficiaries of the tech experience that my children get to enjoy, and I'm looking forward to sharing insights from that perspective with you today. Awesome. Gordon? Hi, everybody. I'm Gordon Swaby. I am the CEO and co-founder of an edtech startup called EduFocal Limited. Nice. And Pat? You're on mute. Pat, you're on mute. Still on mute, Pat. Just have to click the, the mic at the top. Maybe an admin cannot. Maybe she's having the, the same tech challenge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
I will just introduce myself one week while we wait for Pat to come back on. So I am a AISK alum. I graduated in 2014 and I am currently a marketing analytics and operations specialist at a IoT company called Elastic Path Software. And so we are all very um, engraved in tech. And so we also we're just really concerned about what technology in how technology is being used in education throughout the country right now and we want to just address those issues and how covid has impacted jamaica but also to look at a pre-covid world and how we were using utilizing technology in education and the benefits of using technology in education uh, well pat just joined back i just want pat you want to go ahead and introduce yourself Okay, all right. Um, good evening, everyone. Yes, I'm Patricia Watkins. I'm the director. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm the tech. I'm hearing a feedback. Just try again once more. So we can do also is maybe mute if we're if, if um if you're not speaking, you can just mute your mic so that Pat doesn't have feedback. All right, okay, go. Okay, I okay. I'm still hearing feedback, but I'm Patricia Watkins. I'm the tech director at AISK. I've been there for seven years. Um we That's okay, but we can come back. No worries. Uh, let's just, uh, we can jump into the conversation. Hopefully yeah. that will, it will play out. So, okay, schools are closed. Parents are working from home. Now more than ever, we realize like technology is playing such a huge role in our lives and we need to use it to our advantage to shape our children's education. I think that's the goal of this webinar to discuss that. So first of all, I just want to start off by um, kind of getting a better understanding of what is the setup like at AISK? So Pat, could you expound on that? Like how we're using technology at AISK right now? I think Pat is still muted. Okay. Yep, go ahead now. All right, great. Let's One word. All right, ASK is a one-to-one -one Apple device school. What that means is that we, all our stakeholders use Apple devices. Each, our, our students from kindergarten through to grade four are required to use iPad. And those in grade five through 12 are required to use MacBooks. The student's device is their book bag, meaning approximately 90% of their classroom needs are available on their devices. To complement the devices, we have school-based management software that connects teachers to students to parents. When a student enters a classroom at the ISK, much like what happens now in this COVID-19 environment, they open their device there with the guidance of the daily code their assignments, their quizzes, their tests, their textbooks and resource app. Sorry, that was one program. So how long has that been happening, Nicole? We it has been one to one for over twelve years. So this was pre-COVID. This is not a new. This is not a new life for us. In other words, um, and it's been it, it has been just incredible to see how the investment has really paid off, having to swim into this um, COVID nineteen experience. So, what was the thought process behind it? Because you, this is long before COVID. So, why did you decide to implement this one-to-one -one vision? 
um, about 12 years ago when um, we were at Shortwood Road, that was about 2007, um, actually more than 12 years ago, uh, BNS gave us notice to quit. Oh. So yeah, we got, we, we had just moved, we'd been there for a year, we thought we were settling in nicely and then they, we got this, we got to quit, we need a place in two years. So we had to find a, a, um, a site, we ended up finding a greenfield site, which is nine acres of land, no buildings. So we got to dream. And in that dream, what we did was we looked around to see what was happening in the world and all schools were retrofitting at that time. So our head of school at the time, myself and um, Douglas Sibel, the architect and um, head of school, went to Arizona, to Vail, to Vail in Arizona. Um, we met with a school director called Cindy and she had a hybrid um, situation going where they brought no um, books to school, just their laptops. And the teachers put together lesson plans, etc. And that um, district superintendent, Calvin Baker, was really, really nice to AISK because um, at the time, they were the only gig in town that was like that around the world. So they had a, a, a influx of visitors. So they were actually quite used to visitors. We were the only ones that took them up on their offer. And um, they came down, um, they trained our teachers because uh, we decided to pilot for a year. So we went to a pilot situation for 2008, 2009, where grade six was the first group. Um, and we retrofitted the building at Shortwood Road, which was very difficult because the walls were really thick. Um, at the time, I think we were still in dialogue. Um, and when we, decided, when we realized we were going to build, we hired Neil Abrams from Innovative, Innovative Corporate Solutions. Um, and how many people have time I need to move the phone to the right? Is that the correct way? <laughs> anyway, so innovative corporate solutions, and they actually helped us with the plan. So between between um, the school in Vail and innovative corporate solutions, we put together a plan. I was head of that project. Um, the whole project was actually the whole build out. And um, the next one he says, all right, oops. <laughs> Right. Right, guys. But you know, my I, the IG fans really need to check this out. So, you know, we're trying to satisfy everybody. That sounds like a lot. There was, there was a lot to put into a one-to-one -one program. So, like, was it was it all worth it? What were the benefits of that? Well, it is a lot. I mean, if I was to give you um, AISK by the numbers, we have in 2020 right now we have a fiber optic back, backbone. We manage 350 MacBooks, 70 for faculty and staff, which they're actually issued MacBooks, 100 iPads, 615 email accounts, two server rooms, 40 access points, 32 projectors, 20 Apple TVs, IT Lab, 25 Macs, and 80 megs coming in. It's a lot. That's a lot. It's and a lot. Stacey, you have you had the privilege of having your children go to AISK. You have lower school and you had upper school, so the iPad and the the laptop, right? So how was that? What did that look like for your students? And, I mean, your children, and what were the benefits that you saw coming from that? Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I, I can I can definitely say that um, when you as a parent think about the infrastructure, you really aren't thinking of all of the things that um, are a part of the ecosystem, yeah. right? I'm just thinking, oh my God, I'm sending my, my child to school with this iPad, what's gonna happen? And it kind of freaks you out, right? Um, and then because I had both lower school and upper school happening uh, around the same time, my son was also on a MacBook. Mm -hmm. And I think the main bridge I had to cross in my mind was beyond it being oh i'm buying this tool that if they break it you know i've broken my back yes and really arrive at the place that spoke to well what is this tool actually enabling and uh, um and once i start and you kind of see it immediately it's not something you kind of have to wait you know you have to wait on your roi your return on investment to see if they're actually using the tools etc I remember I kept asking, so where are your books? Like, where, where are the, you know, because 
because then I, I'm coming from the traditional system where your book bag has the stuff and you have to get the roller bag because you're carrying all these things and you know um, and so I started those little things it was you know okay so all your stuff is in one place and it's you know having a tech background also helped with appreciating that I I had this resource available to me if they lost their devices they could still get their work done um, and then for me I could now log in and check on them and log in and check on the work and so it was it was a new kind of experience and I did have some mental hurdles to overcome yeah. but I think the the ROI was pretty instant I began I began to see just the benefit of having those tools immediately so yeah yeah that makes sense I remember when I went to AISK my bag got significantly lighter and I was no longer complaining. Like my father used to have to trek with my backpack and help me, and that was no, no longer need need for that. Um, yeah, great. So I would say, like Nick, could you tell us a little bit more about, or even Pat as well? Could you tell us a little bit more about the the Schoology platform itself, how it was utilized before versus what it looks like now after COVID? Next anyone? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Believe it or not, um, who looks, apart from the fact that we're not all physically together, who looks very, very much the same? Schoology is our learning management system. It controls all our classes. It's, each teacher actually operates from a virtual classroom. So the difference is now. The virtual platform Zoom has been transferred online via the conferences feature in the LMS. And so now teachers start their classes of the kids log on and they talk to their teachers via our um, system or conferences. So really the only thing that has changed is the conferencing aspect of it all. But everything before, the checking of the grades, the homework, the grading, everything like that was that was all happening and so we could have gone into classes before and interacted using our technology with our teacher etc and so just now the only difference is the conferencing aspect and and yeah. so the teachers have seen like it nothing has really changed is that what you're you're saying yeah what i'm saying is that school has apart from the physical component our kids are basically up the same way they have Nice. Well, Gordon, I want to hear from you because you are a expert in the space as well. So tell us a little bit more about how you, you play a role in um, technology in education in Jamaica. So, I mean, Shanil, it's just been great listening to the AISK experience so far. Um, I mean, I've obviously heard of AISK, but just getting to know a little bit more um, the operations of the school from a te technological perspective has been, I mean, quite enlightening to say the least. Um, I mean, within within the local context of, um, you know, ed education technology in Jamaica, um, first, let me say that AISK, I mean, is leaps and bounds ahead of any other institution I've heard about so far locally. Um, but, well, first, let me explain what Edifocal is. So, I mean, Edifocal is it's an online um, um, learning tool. It's an online test prep tool. Um, we We've been a test prep tool for um, for the last eight years. Um, we use a concept called gamification to make learning fun. So students sign up to the service. Um, they go through the questions on the platform. They compete against each other for points. And the top student on the platform wins 50,000 Jamaican dollars cash from us annually, right? Um, after COVID, you know, when, we, when, when COVID kind of started to... Um, hit fever pitch here in Jamaica and elsewhere, we decided that we wanted to offer more. Um, and we were planning on offering that um, this year. So what we started offering were live classes. So we've been working with teachers um, for many years. We you know, we work with more than 20 teachers at this point. Um, and instead of them just providing us with content, they started um, having live classes. So uh, between 
between March, middle March, and um, at the beginning of, of say May, we had over 40,000 kids sign up to Edufocal. Um, on any given week, we were having over 100 classes, and in each class, we had over 300 kids. Um, so we leveraged the, the Zoom platform, the Zoom video conferencing tool. But what we do is that we've integrated the Zoom platform into Edufocal. Um, I won't get into the deep technicalities of it, but basically a child need not sign up to Zoom to use or to join the classes on Edufocal. Um, in fact, what was happening in the original stage is that we send an email blast to our entire mailing list of over 70,000 people. Um, and then what would happen is that they they join the classes, but it was a little bit cumbersome because they had to register for, for, for Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, and then what would happen is that sometimes people would join the classes with the name Galaxy S10 or Galaxy Tab. So you don't really know who the student is and there's really no way to kind of authenticate, you know, who these people are. Um, so what we did is that, you know, we, we, we did the integration um, and all that is required now for a child to do is to log into Edufocal, um, go to the class scheduling page, hit hit join. Um, after they join, um, when it's the last time, they just, they, they'll go back to that page and they can join the class. And it registers it registers with Zoom, so we know exactly what the child's name is. There's no registration that needs to be done on their part. So um, that has kind of been how things have drastically changed for us in a very short period of time. Um, you know, and, and and really, as I said, it's been exciting hearing what is happening at, at AISK and definitely I can see how what AISK is doing can be integrated in, into other schools, possibly some of the schools that we've been working with for the last couple of years. I mean, we, we work with over at this point 300 schools in Jamaica um, and I think that a lot can be done um, through AISK's expertise to kind of help to, you know, take the other schools forward and, you know, and pull them to this technological digital future that we're in. Absolutely. I think we're very happy to pay it forward. Um, we we know a lot. Um, we've been we've been doing it for a long time. Um, we know what works, what doesn't work. Um, and very 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 happy to help. Very happy to yeah. help. Just like um, the Vail School helped us in Jamaica, we're very happy to pay that forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, I think that's so important. And I want um, I do want to go into in depth a little bit more gordon just to just say like the true benefits of doing what you do because i think we re we don't realize that we're missing out on a lot by not doing a lot of these uh utilizing technology so mm -hmm. what have you been able to achieve per se by moving towards technology like because we want to show the benefits of that to parents and educators yeah. Um, I mean, right off the top of, you know, right off the top of my head, I'd say personalization is a big, big part of um, leveraging technology. Um, if you think about even the AISK perspective and even the Edufocal perspective, um, I mean, we don't physically have a classroom and our teaching students. So a lot of the students that we're interacting with, if you think about it, we're just meeting them for the first time within that context of, the, you know, they join the platform, but any teacher can log in, pull their data, and see where that child is struggling. So there's one feature we have on the platform called the report card. Um, and how testing is done on Edufocal is on a topic-by-topic um, -topic basis. So if a child is in grade four and they want to take a test, a math test in computation or algebra, they can take a math test in that category. And then the teachers can see what the you know what their results are like. So similarly, if you think about what is happening at ASK, I mean, I, I, that's my dream. I wish I could go back to school and go to ASK. I hate I hate physical books. I'm I'm a, I'm a software guy, tech guy through and through. So I have a Kindle um, because it's easier to highlight the stuff in the books, get it synced up in the cloud. Um, you know, do the analysis. I, I imagine that the same things are happening um, happening happening at AISK. And um, for a teacher to be able to pinpoint um, the issues of a child very quickly is extremely important. Um, so yeah, I'd say to answer your question, definitely personalization of learning is a big win both from the perspective of an LMS within a school or an online learning platform like Edufocal. Yeah, not to mention the things that are actually available. Um, yeah. You know, we talk about personalizing education. I mean, we have this thing called map testing, which we're able to test kids. Remember map testing, oh, actually? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, you're able to test kids in English and um, math and, and, and reading, and you're able to actually pinpoint exactly what part of math is is not working for them whether it's computational numbers whether it's algebra whether it's um measurement 
And so, in other words, if you have a, if you have an issue, you're actually able to see. So we use a lot of data. We're very data driven because the, of the platform. You're talking my language. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's really cool. And that helps significantly because then you're able to like really dive into what you're not good at. So like for me, literature was really hard reading that, reading those things in like an hour and trying to answer those questions. And I realized it was like going into the passages and trying to find those, the, the specific questions in the passage. And then that helped me towards like doing the PSAT and then the SAT and then IB. And so that helped with my critical thinking skills. And that's what I realized I was lacking before when I was doing the map testing. So like, that was great. That's true. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I think, when I think about even my prep school experience, um, I was what you'd call a slow child. Right. Um, but it was only later in my life that I realized that it, it wasn't that I was dumb or stupid. It was just that, um, one, I learned differently, but two, um, discovering that I have what, I guess, ADHD, um, so you know and again thinking about things in a more modern context um I, I i don't know i can only assume that um it, it, you know a school like aisk can readily um pinpoint the, the trouble areas for a child very early and, and help them where they need to get help very easily yeah. and, and as a matter of fact we actually we actually teach to that child so that what map testing actually does is it tells you what the child is doing, it tells you what the cohort is doing, and mm -hmm. then how do you shift curriculum for a particular cohort? Because you may even find that a cohort is maybe an artsy cohort or a science cohort. Mm -hmm. So how do you then um, shift the curriculum to meet those children's needs? Yeah, and you yeah. need data. Yeah. So, and you know, just to add to Nicole, it's again a, a funny anecdotal childhood experience. Um, for me, you know, you're in a class, and this is a real life thing that ha would happen, right? You're in a class, you like this girl, um, you know, she's getting all of the concepts in the class, you're not getting the concepts, but you don't really want to raise your hand because you're going to be embarrassed and the girl that you like is going to think that you're dumb. So you kind of keep it to yourself, you're not saying anything to the teacher, and it only, it's not until test time um, that the teacher, you know, oh, Gordon doesn't understand this concept, right? Versus leveraging data, kind of have, having knowledge checks throat um and the teacher can you know privately or otherwise come to the child and say hey realize that you're struggling with this particular thing so that's how technology is good too um you know it really allows you you know where a child may be embarrassed um a teacher may come forward and and, and intervene where necessary so that that child is not left behind and that's what happened to me i got left behind because i'm a pretty girl you know <laughs> we call it your strengths or your stretches so you yeah. have stretch areas you weren't done yeah. but need to be stretched there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say that another benefit of the technology in education too is that w one of my personal experiences that I there was a portion of time where I I became very ill and I was out of school for months. And honestly, I don't know how I would have gotten back to the point to be on par with my classmates, be graduating at the same time if it weren't for that access to my education at home, because I was at home for, for a few months. <laughs> um, and so that's something that we saw at a very early age. And now that we're in this post COVID world and we're, we're realizing how important it is, I, th I just think that we need to think about that for the future, moving on for people that have limited access. Is it that we can't travel because we can't go to so we, something about we miss the bus or we miss the this. There's some. There's always something, and being able to have that access is so important. I mean, this is our second time in this world. I mean, during the do the incursion, yes, we had to go home. We were online the next day. Yeah, mm. we just went home. Everybody jumped online, and we were doing school. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty that's cool. Make a difference. It does make a huge difference. So Stacey, I want to get your um, input to as a parent. So with all of this technology in the house, how are you empowering your children to use it in technology, to use technology in their education, but also kind of monitor them at the same time? I'm sure I know AISK plays a part in the whole monitoring process, but as a parent, what's your thoughts? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think that one of the things that 
also shifted for me. Again, clearly AISK has been doing a lot of mind shifting on the parent side, right? Yeah. Um, was the thinking around the responsible device use yeah. and that accountability that comes with having access to a device. And so it, it moved from both in my mind and in how I viewed it with my children, it moved from being this fun thing that you get a privilege to use to now being a tool that is, is like having a school book or like having you know your pencil and your tools that you're using for class. So from a monitoring perspective, I actually released the reins a little bit more because you know, I had I had different parents. I had old school parents where it wasn't laptop. It was you're on the phone. You can't on the phone. Come on, you know, like that kind of thinking. And so you read all of this research about screen time and how bad it is, and you know, and it's really more coming from a context of using the technology for fun and for surfing um, social sites and 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 playing games. Yeah. Um, not for learning or for building capacity and capability and accountability and what i saw happening is because it became more of an enabling tool um i found that i didn't necessarily have to be kind of this hawk over the shoulder because they were learning on their own that you know this is my key to success or this is a, one of my keys to success and so i have to be more responsible on my own um, and I think too, because of the use for school, being attached to it for fun wasn't necessarily such a big deal anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And we, I know without you watching, I know Big Brother was still watching at AISK though, because I remember that very specifically with our laptop yeah. image. So Pat or uh, Nicola, do you want to explain a little bit about how AISK helps to mitigate those types of misuses in school, a lot of parents are very fearful of the types of things that their children will be exposed to. But I, I think that we need to like break down the barriers and just show that it really is there. There are many things that we can do to mitigate this and allow them to use it. Right. Okay, we have various levels of um, protection um, built into the laptops. We no longer have that restrictive image that you had we oh. took away, we took away that image but we do have various levels um for example in the middle school we have this software called land school that we run in classes and teachers can actually see what the kids are doing on their screens so if you're in a class and the teacher feel you have become disengaged they can look see what your laptop is doing and they can shut you down so they have that kind of control in class now. Um, also, we help parents to turn on um, controls on the various um, devices that they have. And we have, when we have open houses and so on at school, we invite parents to come in. We give them training on things that they can do um periods that they can lock down kids we can lock you down from nine until six in the morning that okay. kind of thing those things that that have those are the various levels that we have and parents seem very happy with it yeah and i'm i know there are also different apps that parents can utilize you can download via what samsung and iphone and oh, Gordon, you, yeah. you know a little yeah, bit about them, hundreds right? of things that you can use but the apps <laughs> that we yeah i do Apple, a lot of it is built in. Sorry, sorry, Gordon. A lot of the security no, right. is already built in. So they yeah. just have to turn them on. Sorry, go ahead, Gordon. No, no, I was just making, no, I was just echoing what, what Chanel was saying, but yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, great. So, okay, I know this is may maybe a little bit more sensitive. So there are a few schools out there that are not empowering technology in education, right? Do you have any idea of what that looks like, how people are addressing that right now? And what do you think some of the challenges are for them to get up to speed? And what are the children kind of missing out on by not having this level of access? So I can jump on that. Um, so, you know, I remember years ago, so we started Edifocal in 2012. Um, and I remember years ago interacting with a few teachers and the general 
the general rhetoric was, oh, I've been getting great results with a CSEC or GSAT results at the time for years. There's no way I'm going to be getting into this technology thing as they like to refer um, to it. You know, they're not going to bother with this technology thing, right? So a lot of teachers, I think, believe that because they're getting good grades or because their their students are getting good grades and that chalk and talk is working for them, they're not going to try anything else. Yeah. Um, here we are in 2020 and thousands of teachers across Jamaica have more or less been forced to kind of adopt this idea of, you know, leveraging technology in a huge way. So a lot of capacity building has had to happen um, in a very short period of time. Um, things that would take three, four years to learn, people had to learn in a very short space of time. Um, and, you know, you know, you can't pull people and drag people into learning certain things. Um, but at the end of the day, it is important that you have a mindset of um, continuous learning, you know, wanting to always learn new things. And that's just not applicable. That's not only applicable to teachers, that's applicable to anybody in whatever field they are in. So. I think that in this particular period, there are many unfortunate circumstances, but certainly one of the things that is not unfortunate is the fact that there are many teachers across Jamaica now who are looking at technology and saying, wow, this is exciting. In fact, there was one teacher that messaged me saying, Gordon, I'm so excited. It's a prep school. I won't call the prep school's name, obviously. You know, but, you know, she messaged me on WhatsApp and she's like, Gordon, I'm so excited about this, this virtual learning stuff. I, I've been enjoying it. Um, if you want to include me more in some edifocal stuff, please let me know. And I said to her, no problem. I'll definitely reach out soon. So um, I, I think you have different um, schools of thought on it, of course, and that's fine. You have some teachers who are extremely frustrated. They don't want anything to do with technology. But you have another set of teachers who are, you know, very excited and really want to, you know, to, to deep dive in, in, into learning more. I, I, another fear that teachers have, um, I'd say, is actually they fear being replaced by technology. Um, you know, and, again, and again, that's that's a general concern too. You, know, you, know, you look at it, looking at it in a broader scale, a lot of people are afraid of being replaced by technology. And here's a hard cold truth: you will be replaced by technology if you're not again thinking about continuous learning. You know, um, yeah. like for me, for example, I I'm 29 now. Um, I I joined I joined Twitter over a decade ago. Um, now I'm seeing all of these cool new social media apps popping up like TikTok, you know? <laughs> so now I feel old, right? Like, I log into this application. I mean, I, and I've put out like one or two TikToks. I think that's what you said, you know, refer to it as, but I put out one or two TikToks. Um, I think my first one was pretty good. Um, but that's me, like I'm always open to learning new stuff. I, I don't want to get to a place in my life where I'm saying, ah, this is a young, a young people think this, I'll leave it alone because that's exactly what happened to people before, right? So you always want to have this mindset. And I'd say that definitely a lot of teachers have benefited from this period in terms of learning and leveraging the technology and getting excited about it. And those are the teachers that will not be replaced by technology. And I hope that I, I do hope that majority of teachers um you know have that kind of mindset. I would just like to um to add to what, what Gordon says um about the, the prohibitive factors, right? And you're so right, Gordon, fear is a huge component of it, right? And I think too that that's where the, um, the, the two things that are kind of top of mind for a lot of the um, private sector groups, for example, the JCS of which I'm president, of the Jamaica Computer Society, and also the um, Innovation and Digital Transformation Committee inside of the PSOJ. Um, of which I'm a member, we're now kind of looking at what are the big things that we're struggling with as a society as it relates to education. Mm -hmm. And in, um, in a meeting, which we had a meeting earlier today, and it, it kind of boiled down to, aside from policy and procedures and working with the government on putting the necessary things in place, it's access and literacy. Yep. Because the truth is that you have a lot of schools, a lot of families, a lot of teachers that don't have internet access. Yeah. yeah. And so getting online in the first place is a hurdle, right? And then the next space is the literacy component. So that that introduces the fear because as a teacher, you're supposed to know, right? And so when you introduce something that they don't know, the natural response is frustration, annoyance, anxiety, you know, um, rejection. 
Um, and so I think one of the ways that AI stays positioned, you kind of alluded to this earlier, Nicola, is um, positioned to be a thought leader in this space um, that we can leverage to support getting other educational institutions aligned. You know, so that is a real benefit that I see that AISK can offer and partner with these organizations to kind of bridge that gap that's that's there. Yeah, I mean, one of the funny things I've always found is that, you know, you've never gotten a phone call to ask about the program, never, which I find so strange because if you have someone in your backyard who's actually getting it done, um, come find out. You know, and um, we're willing to hold your hand right away through the process. You know, and we do understand that for many schools, resources, financial resources are restrictions, but there's more than one way to skin a cat, particularly if you really are committed to getting, getting it done. Yeah, agreed. You know, and, and you know, Nicola, to, to your point, um, I mean, there's probably so much politics involved in that um, and touching on some of the things I mentioned. You may have um, teachers, sorry, you may have a, a principal who is very much, you know, gung ho on integrating technology into his or her school, but then you have a group of teachers or you have a board who is not going to give him or her the kind of support that they want. And they're trying to do one thing and then they're getting pushback saying, oh no, that's not something that we want to do right now. And it becomes frustrating, so, you know, sometimes. It definitely needs mine. I mean, because I mean, even when we started, um, you you did have a few teachers who you know were not, they're just not comfortable, and you, you get that they're not comfortable. But what you have to do is you have to put PD in place, um, and you have to you know bring everybody along. And but I, I don't, to be honest, I don't I can recall having those kind of issues. Um, more than, you know, we, we knew we were going in this direction. We knew we had to go in this direction if we were going to serve the students, particularly like a Chenille who, you know, needed that, that runway of technology before getting into university and then going into life. I mean, many of our students, I think when they go and they, they, they work in the summers, um, like for instance, IC or any other companies, a lot of the, um, the, the, the people in those companies are actually quite shocked at how our kids are just able to just move fluidly into the into, into tech at work. You know, and yeah. It's, yeah. It, is a, it is a skill that is definitely required for living in today, not even tomorrow, but today. Yeah. And, you know, to add again, Nicola, you know, things are moving so quickly, technologically. Um, just so many things are being released, so many things are are being developed and you know it's it's it, it can be overwhelming at times um you know and i do feel it for a teacher or a child who has never used a laptop before has never used um a tablet before they've just not engaged with technology in any way i mean my co-founder paul um paul started using he's, he's from deep rural um saint anne right paul started using computers when he was maybe 12 or 13 and i mean you know, here he is in his early 30s and he's one of the best developers that I know. Can you imagine if he, he got the opportunity to use technology even earlier in his life, right? So I think I think there are so many young people right now walking around in Jamaica who they're just waiting on an opportunity. So, I mean, so going back to Paul, Paul got his first computer when, I, I don't know, some relative or whoever, you know, came down to send and handed him a laptop and said, hmm, he said, the laptop, try it out. And he tried it out and he loved it. And, you know, you know, here, here, that was his life. You know, that, that was the beginning really of his life because that, that is how he has made his wealth. Right. Um, so I, I, you know, I do hope for the day that, you know, not only Jamaican children, but Jamaican teachers, um, you know, as many, as many people as possible get the opportunity to get exposed to technology. Otherwise we're going to be get left behind. I mean, you know, the world is going to leave us behind. Absolutely. I don't think that we, um, recognize enough the little things that go into using technology. Like I remember um, Gordon and I were, were talking about how some people don't even know how to use the web browser itself. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the simplest thing. But like one of the other things too is being able to do research properly. Are you are you able to to cite things? Because you don't want to be have any copyright infringement. You know, like being able to research properly. 
I, I had an experience. I went, I did my master's and I encountered kids that they had no idea how to do any citations. I had to take on that load. And that's because they were never, all of the entire education system, they did not have access to laptops to write essays or to write papers. Everything was written in the books and it was so hard for them to catch up. And I saw that in real life, 2019. Yeah. So, yeah. And I don't want, and then these are international countries, yeah. of course. And I feel like there's sometimes that like Jamaica does fall into that category where we just don't, we're not up to speed on some of those simple yeah. things that we should know. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, think about it. Which modern organization can you be involved in in 2020, whether in Jamaica or elsewhere, that does not require basic computer skills? I can't think of any. I mean, technology is no longer the thing for the IT people. No. Yeah. It is the way it was seen for a very long time. And yeah. that's actually what this pandemic has brought to the forefront is that technology is an enabler. We're all IT people. We're all IT people. Yeah. <laughs> Bodies yeah. are we're, at, we're at varying levels on the ladder, but we're all IT people and we yeah. all have some level of IT, um, IT skills to navigate this brand new world, yes. right? Um, you know, and that's just the reality. So it's either you're going to sink or swim. Absolutely. Gordon, you have a question. Yeah. You see? Oh, me? Yeah, Gordon, I said, what is the climb or disconnect from low tech high school to the expectations of university or further tech capacity at work? That's a lot of that word. Come again, read that question again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's what is the climb or disconnect mm -hmm. from low tech, high, low tech high schools to the expectation of university or further tech capacity at work? Okay, I, I hope I understand that question correctly. I think you're basically talking about the gap that is in between. Yeah, yeah. I do, yeah. yeah. All right, Um. I mean, Never personally, I, was, I've not, I wasn't personally in a situation like that, but I can say just based on what I've seen and experienced, it's a huge, I mean, Shanila, I actually think you're better equipped to answer that question in terms of you've spoken about, um, you know, experiences with, with people at your school. Um, and you touched on it earlier about people not knowing how to cite stuff, um, whether the APA format or whatever other format. I mean, maybe you should share a little bit more of that experience, um, but it's a huge gap. It, is how I'd answer that question. Um, but if you want to touch on the specifics of it, um, because yeah, you have already examples. Yeah, I agree. Um, there are certain things that just prepare you, right? So you have the presentations. You have to be able to co cohesively bring together a, a bunch of information and present that so well that the, the audience that you are presenting to they understand exactly what you're saying without not understanding, without having no prior knowledge of the the topic that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's a very difficult skill, I find. And I don't see a lot of people that really master it. And it takes, it's, that's just facts, right? Yeah. <laughs> I agree with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's difficult. And I feel like having access to the technology where you, so like for me, how I, how I prepare for a presentation, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a PowerPoint master, first of all, and I spend time doing that. But then I'm able to go on my computer, record myself, and I'm like, oh boy, Shanil, you're not really doing so well with that one. I don't even know what you're talking about. And so just that that's, that one-on-one -on -one time with myself, I'm able to practice and just like get better. And so that's how I was learning from that. Um, there's the, we have this thing at AISK called the extended essay. And I feel like that was my first thesis um that i ever did because it's like you have a research topic you're you decide your own research topic that's the first thing that was the first level of maturity that you get by deciding your own research topic then going into that citing you not you don't want to sound we, we have like great citations there and then so like from that that was difficult i think it was only what six pages or ten pages Anthony. and i was like whoa that was hard words 4,000 words and I was that was that was ridiculous and then I had to actually do two theses after that and that was a breeze after doing that like going to going to college I never had to think about writing I just just got in the zone and I wrote um and then go ahead I think what happens to our kids is that when they actually get to university they actually have their academics and their management of their day and everything all down pat all they're concentrating now on is not feeling homesick yeah. Yeah. 
that that really is it. And I guess from the beginning, you teachers aren't spoon feed, spoon feeding you at AISK, right? They they really they give you the tools and you have to leverage them. And that's exactly what it was like in college. And I feel like a lot of people who did not have that experience of just being let go to do what they needed to do, they struggled. They struggled for like the first to two years until they finally got it. Whereas I got it from the first year. And so that way I was I was able to thrive through all four years. And so I, I think, think that's um, the difference. I think in, in I think one of the differences that I've noticed um, in relation to the question that was asked about the climb um, is that we don't it's not this the way it was before where you didn't have any access to technology. The truth is that our phones right um, on this island um, the way that phone consumption is it's literally one and a half phones to each person in the population when they do like when you look at the, the metrics for um, devices it's basically saying each person on the island has one and a half phones right so what what you see is that persons have access to technology um, in the most rudimentary sense but they are not translating that to um, useful and meaningful sources beyond entertaining themselves. So where you'll have students in a low tech high school environment, everybody's on their Facebook and on their IG and doing their TikToks, which I'm now on TikTok too, um, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> doing their TikToks, right? Um, when you now put them in front of a task and say, even using your phone, create something, you know, develop something that you have to share um, and mix, you know, with a wider community. Um, that's where there is a gap. And so when I think about the climb, there's, it's a lot more around literacy mm. and have, having actually recognized the purpose of the technology and how they can use that to not just enjoy themselves, but to really enable for their betterment and the betterment of their community. You know, that's the, that's the gap, that's the real gap. Because I think the technical side, you can learn it. You see that culture piece? It's, it's something that really has to be at the forefront of all of our minds. And how do we actually play a part in, making, in creating that shift? Yeah. Yes, Stacey, that is so true. Because I think a lot of people associated, like you said, the phones with fun. Yeah, and not understanding that they're very useful because at AISK, sometimes our students forget their chargers, their laptop dies, and they get out their phone and they get out the phone and they can access the, the software from the phone. So they know that they can get onto school, they can get onto the conference from their phone. But oh, like you say, it's a culture, it's a culture. You have to be taught. And until you experience it, um, someone has to go out there and teach them. Yeah. Uh, uh, they said, um, someone would like you to expound a little bit more on tech literacy. Can you just give an example of what you mean? Um, so when I speak of tech literacy, it's, it's creating that connection between the different access channels that you use for technology. So whether it's a phone or a laptop or your television, because now TVs are smart, mm -hmm. uh, you know, light things like your iPad or a Chromebook, for example, it's it's identifying for them the different ways that you can interact with the devices so that it's not just about entertainment. So literacy is beyond just teaching them about the technicalities of the device and the 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 um the use like you, know, you need to make a presentation at work but also understanding that it's an enabler for capacity and capability building it's an enabler to help you to have an edge when you're going in for that job interview or that university that university um application uh so for me digital and I, we, we refer it more to as digital literacy is more holistic and it touches everybody touches the the person that has a device, usually the child, 
and the parent that they're relating to so that they're not left out because a lot of parents they're way further be behind than the kids yeah right so it encompasses you as an individual and the community that you are a part of and then therein comes in parental fear yeah that's a whole other story because you do have to be responsible around their children's use it's no different to having kids hooked on tv like my kids when they were growing up they didn't they weren't allowed to watch tv during the week um what do you do with um device what is the device yes you do shut it down yeah uh, one of the things you know just going back to the question that anna asked earlier about the climb um i'd say one big skill um is actually research skills um and a lot of people i think a lot of people are intimidated by researching and i mean that's where everybody researches um no right online um you know you leverage google chances are you're using google um but your process of research is important so me for example i use i use an application called evernote um yeah. I've used it for years. I mean, I've been I've been using Evernote now for about 13 years. Um, I stopped using it. I tried a, a bunch of other tools, but um, it's really good in terms of being able to clip items online, um, online clip articles online, highlight highlight specific sections, having powerful search features, being able to search entire PDF documents. So if you think, for example, let's say let's say there's a 300 page PDF document, um, and I put it in Evernote, and I want to pick up the keyword. Um, education in that document. I just type it in, and it searches the database of it's my. It says it's essentially my own curated database of information, and I pick up the information that I want very quickly. I see those things as a competitive advantage in this new world because we're processing so much information on a daily basis. We need to be able to decipher it to to pull on the relevant parts of it, um, and that, those those things are competitive advantage in business in life, um, and has worked out pretty well for me. So. Um, in terms of that climb, I've always been fascinated with technology and I've been deeply involved in those things from very early. Um, and you know, it has been extremely beneficial. I, I, I dropped out of university, so I don't know about the 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 climb going through, but yeah. <laughs> well, you touch on something very important there though, even with the research, you know, what's you know, what's good information, what's bad information. Yeah. You know, and those are the things that you have to learn. And it also one of the things is that yes, we have information at the tips of our fingers. So do we need to memorize anymore? You know, and if you look, look at Bloom's taxonomy, memory is the very bottom of the uh, of the intelligence spectrum, where you you know you learn, you synthesize, you analyze, and then you create. And creativity is the top of it. So what the what the technology actually gives you is access to information, but how do you manipulate it? How do you use it? What's good information? So that's where that's where the literacy actually comes in. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And Chris raised a good point. He said yeah. it's an experience that our society, generally speaking, does not take advantage of technology outside of entertainment. I believe if the technology is promoted in the broader community, the buying among members of the community would increase. The promotion of online banking, for example, comes to mind. Introducing the topic of schools is a great start, but aligning the tech outside the classroom would be the ultimate enabler. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And we, we haven't even begun to talk about just like the other capabilities of technology outside of the traditional, like I'm going to do my math, my physics, my science, and go to college. Like, I find that the exposure to different applications uh, in technology really opened up my mind to something. So like before, I wanted to be like a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. And at AISK, we, one of the first applications I used was this app called SketchUp. And I didn't understand that like you could, you could build things virtually like in 3d it was like, obviously it was very it still it was very minimal at most but i i got that exposure to to that tool and so i was able to kind of think outside of the box like oh actually i don't need to be a doctor maybe i could be like this construction this story you know and and the access to like different music tools art tools and it just it gives you so much more variety and it allows children to kind of explore more outside of the the generic occupations that we aspire to be you know um and so that yeah. is really beneficial as well mm -hmm. absolutely 
Ooh. Well, um, are there any closing notes that we wanted to say before we end? I thought this was a great conversation. We got a lot out. <laughs> Um, my closing remarks are, um, I'm sending my child to ASK once I have the child and he is of eight. <laughs> um, no, seriously though, but um, yeah, ASK seems to be a great school from what I, um, I've discovered today. Um, but yeah, ultimately, you know, technology isn't going anywhere. Um, we're becoming, you know, even more steeped in technology, um, you know, just Leveraging technology can enhance your life, and, and and I'd encourage everybody to maintain a curious, having a curious mind. Um, always trying to learn new things. Currently, I'm trying to learn how to use TikTok. Um, that's my current challenge. Um, and and you know, and I'm being serious. Like it has nothing to do with TikTok, and more about maintaining that 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 curious mind. Because um, I think once you can maintain that curious mind, you'll always have an edge, and and that is going to be a, um, a source of competitive advantage in this in this sometimes challenging world. Yeah. I also want to say that parents need to embrace technology more because their children are embracing it. Their children are going way ahead of them. Um, there's, a, there's a good side to technology and there's also a dark side to technology. And parents need to be aware so that they can help their, their children to ride the ways or to, to to find the proper line between the two so that's my last word parents need to get involved yeah they can't stay off and say i i'm not for technology i don't understand it they can't see that any longer uh, my final thoughts are um one i'm definitely happy to be a parent that is um experiencing the aisk way and I would just encourage others, whether it's a parent, an administrator, um, or whoever it is that is uh, watching this webinar or the replay, to reach out. You know, reach out to AISK and 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 start asking those questions, um, because not only um, are they open. I think right now there's a um, a way for you to actually see how distance learning is working at the school, but I think. Also, if there are just questions and curiosity about technology, we have literally a pilot in our backyards and we need to take advantage of that opportunity that's available to us. Um, for me, I'd say be not afraid. <laughs> you know, um, come and check it out. We're, we're always happy to share. Uh, and as Stacy said, it's right here in our own backyards and we are doing it in Kingston, in Jamaica, and we're doing it really well. So um, teach us, don't be afraid to, um, to, to email us um, and don't be afraid to come and check it out. And parents as well, and you know, you know hold your hand, you get it done. <laughs> Yeah, um, on that note, can everyone see my screen? Absolutely. Okay, great. So um, this was a great series. Uh, the next series are coming up June 2nd and June 9th, uh, June 16th and the 23rd, where we have, we have the tours and I believe we have open houses. You can click the link in the AISK Jamaica bio to register. And this will be really good to learn about that. I'll tell you what we're doing here. What we're doing here is we're having virtual open houses mm -hmm. um, across the division. So it's early years program first. Then we're having the elementary school, then middle school, and then high school. And you, um, we're going to tell you about the programs. We're also going to tell you about the opening COVID-19 plan because, ladies and gentlemen, it is real. Um, and capacity is going to be um, very small, not, not as much as we usually are able to take in, but um, those, they're being hosted by Campbell and Ben Walker. And you're going to hear from um, Pat will be there talking about technology, uh, curriculum director, and of course, we're going to come, we're going to come on and talk about the programs. But come and check out the programs, uh, it's free, and you can do it right there in your homes. Every Tuesday evening for the next four Tuesday evenings at six o'clock. Nice. Okay, and then I'm sure like there will be other things going out as well, right?
for right. Yes, awesome. Well, you can do a virtual tour. What was that? You can do a virtual shadow. Oh, yes. Come and shout out in our virtual program and check out what we're like virtually as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you, panelists, for joining us. This was really great. I hope everyone enjoyed um, this. Like I said before, this webinar will be up on our AISK YouTube. And uh, see you next time. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.